Okay, so we're coming to an end of our course on um, violence. And it's interesting to look back at the whole course and try and see how the different parts fit together. But even more, it's interesting to look at how our idea of violence has changed through the course. And one of the things you would have realized from the very beginning is that this course is not just about the normal way people might think about violence, which is um, kind of what do we do need to do about violent criminals? How are we going to identify them or um, punish them or rehabilitate them? But it's really about the, the very concept of violence, like the, the word violence itself is one of the things that we examine and try and look, look at. And so we see right from the beginning of the course that one of the reasons we want to study violence rather than other aspects of um, criminal justice, for instance, is that it cannot be reduced to the idea of crime. Um, there are types of violence that are not criminalized and there, and there are many crimes that are not violent. So the, 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 the category of criminality and the category of violence, the overlap in some ways, but in other ways they don't. And what's interesting, uh, is to look at the ones in which they don't as much as the ones in which they do. Because then when we start looking at the question of violence, we're not just looking at the question of, well, is something illegal or not? Should it be punished or not? We're looking at it, we, we immediately are able to frame the problem differently. And instead of being a problem of, is it a crime? We can ask, does it cause harm? And that may seem like a subtle difference, but it actually completely changes the way we think about the topic. Thinking about things that are harmful um, versus things that are criminalized really does reframe it very deeply. And one of the things we, we, we said from the outset is that, that people's sense of being threatened by violence, whether that, those are real threats or whether they imagine threats, really very, very powerfully affect them. It powerfully affects their kind of emotional state. Um, it powerfully affects how people um, interpret the, the world. It powerfully affects how people interact with each other. So because violence is, is scary, I mean, that's the essential thing, that, that the one thing we don't want is to be victims of brutal violence. Because it causes such a, a kind of emotional response, um, it... It, it has a powerful effect on other kinds of thinking and other kinds of social interaction. And that's another really interesting thing to look at, about, about how much of how people think about the world is determined by what kinds of violence they, they're worried about. So if they're worried about serial killers or terrorism or rapists, or um, each, each of those is an idea of a threat which actually changes the understanding of the world and changes the way people live in the world and interact with each other. Um, and the important thing is that, um, that these reactions sort of shape a whole lot of other ideas and values and political commitments and um, uh, ideas of what, what needs to be done in the world, what, what needs to be fixed, how it needs to be fixed. Um, and and so the so 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 the the kind of lived experience that the 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 sense of being threatened by violence is a very powerful determinant of a whole lot of other social things that are worth looking at. Um, the other thing that we we pointed out very early on is that everyone thinks about violence in certain ways. It's, it, it's a kind of a topic that, that people, they don't sit in a formal way and discuss theories of violence, but everyone has got ideas about what's wrong, um, what, what is violence and what isn't. Um, and it's not that they have a philosophical view of that, they've got a practical sense of, well, doing this is violent. Um, uh, you know, shooting someone in a road raid in incident is violent, but other things are not violent. So giving, giving your kids a spanking when they are deliberately disobedient, that's not violent. So, so, so the whole idea of what is and isn't violent is already something that people have ideas about formed in their heads. Um, they've got ideas about what causes violence. Um, um, like what, what you know? What, why do some people become? Why do some people become serial killers? Um, um, who is dangerous is an important aspect of that. Um, who should you fear? 
Um, do you um, do you do you feel pe fear people of a particular uh, nationality, particular uh, people of um, uh, um, in uh, particular situations, people who look a certain, physically look a certain way, um, and all of these link to the 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 kind of big thing that we need to think about is all of the, those ideas all link together in ideas about what should be done about violence. Um, like if given that it's a problem, what should be done about it? And and so all these theories about well, what is violent? Who is violent? Um, then impact on these theories. So, for instance, uh, um, that 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 the idea that um, that um, we discuss at one point that 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 certain categories of migrant are particular are, are potentially involved with violent crime leads to the idea that we need to um, uh, restrict migration. Um, the idea that um, that certain kinds of um, personality type, like psychopaths, are, are violent means that um, what we need to do is identify people like that and then and then separate them from society. We need to incarcerate them. Um, so these ideas these ideas have a practical life. Um, these assumptions, these these intuitive beliefs, lead people to thinking about. Um, uh, having uh, thinking about the world in a certain way, but having very strong commitments um, to wanting to see certain things done and not to see other things done. And the problem that we pointed out very early on is that most of these ideas, people don't even know that they have them. They kind of live with them in a practical way, but they don't reflect on them. And because they don't reflect on them, it becomes impossible for them to check whether those ideas are true or not, because they because they the, the ideas don't exist as a sort of a, a, a statement of principles that they can articulate necessarily. Um, they can't say, "Oh well, I have this belief," and then get involved in the discussion. Well, is that belief true or not? Um, are children more likely to be sexually assaulted by strangers than by than by family members and family friends? Um, unless we, unless we're aware of a belief like that, we can't really test it. Is um, giving people longer prison sentences an effective deterrent against them committing violent crimes? Um, unless we're, unless we're conscious of holding such a belief, um, we can't raise the 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 very real question. Well, well, is that true? When we actually look at um, uh, more punitive forms of incarceration. Do they actually reduce rates of violence in societies? Um, does the death penalty reduce rates of violence? So all of these are, are important questions, but the, the, the issue we're raising is that everyone walks around with an everyday common sense intuitive theory of violence. And the dangerous thing about it is they're not aware of it and they can't check whether it's true or not. They just act as if it's true in certain ways. And the problem being that those theories um, can actually um, lead to worse problems. The, the theories might in fact be exacerbating violence. They might be creating more social violence rather than decreasing it. Okay. Um, then we went to look at um, the question of um, guns and violence. And this is a really interesting example um, because it's an example of the, the way in which people kind of disagree with each other about violence. And it, it starts as a very simple question around should, um, you know, private individuals, should citizens be allowed to own guns? But that in itself is actually hides a deeper question, which is, does having a gun make you safer? Does having a firearm to defend yourself against the dangerous people in the world, does that make you safer or doesn't it? And on the one hand, it's easy to see the answer, yes. I mean, people, yes, obviously, then if someone breaks into your house, you point a gun at them and tell them to get out. Um, and they will, um, and you'll be safer. Um, you know, the obvious sense in which people feel powerful. Um, and, but, but what's interesting is um, that this, this, this is highly contested and it's especially contested in the United States rather than in Australia. Um, and but what's so interesting about it, the first thing that we kind of really dug into is that whether people believe that there should be restrictions on private ownership of guns is not really much 
determined by the evidence. The evidence is in. The evidence is the more that people own guns in society, the more dangerous it becomes. The more homicides there are, um, um, that, that, that people owning guns tend not to use them in self-defense. They tend to use them in states of emotional um, uh, distress. Um, they tend to use them in, uh, you know, jealous rages or, or suicidal depressions. Um, they don't actually end up using them in self-defense, even though they buy them with the intention of using them in self-defense. In fact, that's not what happens. Um, and this is known, and it's also known that, that it doesn't decrease crime. Having lots of citizens with guns doesn't decrease crime. It, it, in, it significantly increases risks of, of, of violent crime. It also escalates the violence between police and citizens. Um, so that's the interesting thing is that that in fact the researchers know that they should be that, that it is much better to, to seriously restrict um, private gun ownership. But in places like the United States, um, it's impossible to get consensus on that and it's impossible for politicians to pass rational research based laws um, because other things are going on. And one of the things we looked at, is that there are specific interest groups influencing public opinion. So you have the National Rifle Association, which is essentially a PR company for the arms, private arms industry. So they um, pretend to be a sort of popular gun owners um, re representative group, but in fact, they're heavily funded by the industry and they, and they both put out um, extensive pro-gun propaganda campaigns, but they also um, bribe politicians. They also contribute to political campaigns and also intimidate politicians by running campaigns against um, politicians who argue for um, restrictions on unregulated gun ownership. Um, so there we see a, the way in which kind of interest groups like sheer material uh, in, um, economic interests actually shape the, the way violence is thought about in a, in a particular society. But they do it in very specific ways and they tell very specific stories and they come up with these um, slogans like uh, the only thing to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun or slogans like guns don't kill people, people kill people. And this is meant to sort of produce this particular ideology of um, the, 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 the right of people to own guns. And of course, when we looked at it more deeply, we also saw it was linked to masculinity in an important way. There's the, 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 the sense of men um, being trained that they should feel powerful, that they should feel like they're able to protect members of their family. All of these sort of plug into the idea of a of a of a of a gun as 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 giving as as giving one a certain kind of power and of getting rid of feelings of kind of vulnerability. Um, but we also then clearly showed that this was not just an individual belief that people held, but uh, and nor is it a belief that's derived from evidence, but the, but there's strong kind of cultural formations behind the beliefs um, around gun ownership. And then, we, but we also looked at the way in which those could be contested, and the way in which March for Our Lives, as in a kind of emergent youth-based. Um, uh, movement mobilized on social media and started really challenging some of that received wisdom. But the essential that thing there was a way in which the guns debate was really gave us insight into how complex beliefs about violence are and how they can be manipulated. From there, we, we went on to a very particular Melbourne example, which is the, the sort of recent moral panic about the Apex Gang that, that really was in its sort of biggest, um, perhaps around 2017, 2018. Um, and this idea of this um, gang of um, Sydney's youth who were terrorizing suburbs of Melbourne, uh, being involved with violent street crime, uh, serious home invasions, um, and a real kind of sense of like amongst certain, amongst the media that that Melbourne was going through a kind of a crisis of social safety. That you know ordinary citizens were were were, um, were terrified. And one stage, uh, um, Minister Peter Dutton himself made made this press statement saying Melbournians are scared to go out to uh, to restaurants to in the evening because because they are so terrified of these violent criminals. Um, 
And of course, this is interesting. It goes back to our, you know, the, the way in which talk about violence focuses on particular kind of street crime, focuses on particular kind of offenders, very visible offenders, strangers, outsiders who seem to not be part of the, the community. Um, and as soon as we looked at that, it, 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 it became really clear um, that the media was deeply involved with the social construction of the, of the Apex Gang and that the Apex Gang, in a sense, really fitted with the, 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 the commercial media's need to, to generate attention grabbing headlines. So we look at the theory of newsworthiness, we look at the theory of moral panics, the way, way these, the, the, these existing social problems, there certainly was some street crime, there certainly was a, a bit of a, a fray at the Mumba festival one year. Um, but the way in which um, this, this gets hyped up, uh, but in a particular way that polarizes people against scapegoat groups, and also imagines people, to, gets people to imagine that they're much less safe than they really are, and that their enemy is much more visible than it really is. And the problem is, easily solved by um, populist kind of interventions like uh, repressive policing, anti-immigration policies. Um, uh, so all of these start becoming effects. But what's very clear in that example, which is so clear in many examples, is the racialization of, of the threat of violence. The idea that violence is uh, not only linked to outsiders, it's not only linked to people who seem visibly different, it's then often linked to questions of race. Um, and there's, this, there's a long history of, um, of kind of inversion, a denial of the way in which sort of globally colonialism was incredibly violent and instead an attribution of violence towards people who were colonized um, and particularly then dark-skinned people. Um, so the, the interrelation between the kind of construction of of uh, the, these, these stranger danger, these external threats um, and the racialization of that danger and then how that actually becomes a justification for further racism, mm -hmm. for further prejudice, for further social exclusion. It's a really important part of that whole analysis. But we saw there once again that the fear of crime, the fear of violence, I should say, isn't about a realistic assessment of that violence. It's about a, a about a moral panic constructed in the media, just as the realistic assessment of whether guns make you safer wasn't based on research evidence, it's based on, on uh, uh, political manipulation by commercial interest groups. Okay, um, and from there we went on and explored another issue, which is the question of, of the, which, which is really in the re recent context of Black Lives Matter and the focus on police brutality in the United States. And once again, uh, we, we, we're comparing, you know, the US and Australia and other countries because the US is a strange example of a of very economically developed country that's actually very violent. And normally those two things don't go together, but, but in this case they do. But it wasn't just a question of, the, of, of police brutality. It really be, became a deeper question of what kinds of violence are socially acceptable. And one of the versions of that is who is allowed to be violent. And this fact that, 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 um, that countries give certain people permission to be violent. In fact, that, that we looked at that definition of the very definition of a nation is a, is a group that, that um, uh, gives itself the monopoly on violent, violence so that the governments actually create legitimated violent entities. They, they, they create armies, they create police forces that are allowed to use violence completely legally um, and they're allowed to use them against other sister, citizens. And of course it's regulated. I mean, in, in democratic countries, the police can't just walk into your home and shoot you in the head, right? But, but there are circumstances under which agents of the state are allowed to be violent. Um, and it becomes this really interesting question because we often assume that all violence is regarded as bad, but yes, there's, there's violence is regarded as good. And then it becomes a contested issue. How violent should the police be? When should the police be allowed to um, assault or kill uh, citizens? Um, um, and, 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 and in different countries, this plays out sort of very differently in different legal systems. 
But what became clear in the US example is firstly, there was really quite astonishing levels of, of police violence, police killing a thousand citizens a year. Um, but also that it was particularly racialized that, um, that the massive disproportion um, of violence against African Americans versus European Americans. Um, and once again, that is linked to historically racist ideas, a historical construction of black men as, as threatening. Um, and, um, and so we see the, 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 the history of ideas of violence being inextricably linked to the history of ideas about, about race. Um, um, and what what we what we see happening is that, um, and especially um, in the the documentaries that you watched, um, the way in which the, the the sort of acts of 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 racist violence, like the police um, killing um, black men who who weren't armed, who were involved with very minor offences, um, that that's simply a manifestation of a much much deeper systemic. Um, form of social equality that 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 those emerge from patterns of of exclusion, deprivation, marginalization, kind of racist um, uh, constructions of 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 different social groups, um, and so the 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 individual acts of 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 r racist violence. Um, are inseparable from those 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 histories of racism and and the in the the structural racism that is built into the society but then we also looked at the way in which black lives matter has become really important and and particularly the way in which contestation of who can represent violence and the fact that previously the the, the you know if, if the police killed someone they would be almost the only people who could give an account of what would happen and that there there's a long history of the police giving false misrepresentative accounts. Um, and the way in which just this fact of people carrying uh, phones with cameras suddenly meant that people could visually document the murders being committed by police and that these could circulate on the internet and become widely known in a way that they, they couldn't in the traditional media and they couldn't when, when, when the police and the state controlled uh, access to information in certain ways and, and how that's created um, a distinct possibility. But then that's also lent, led to the contestation around how the Black Lives Matter protests have been represented, whether they've been represented as kind of destructive, uh, kind of anarchy and law breaking for its own sake, or whether they're being represented as, as, a, as, a, as a very, very important um, human rights activity um, as a kind of last stand against a, a homicidal abuse of power by agents of the state. And so we see the, the, these, these competing narratives around Black Lives Matter and, 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 and who's able to shape those narratives uh, and to what ends. Okay, then we sort of went into a new part of the course. Um, and this part is, is divided into two sections. Firstly, we looked at violence against children for a while. And secondly, we looked at violence and gender for three weeks. Okay, and the first thing when looking at violence and children, we took another of these controversies. And th in this case, it's a controversy around, around corporal punishment. Um, and it's a really interesting one because it's such a good example about how the kind of definition and meaning and justification of violence uh, is constructed and how certain kinds of violence is normalized. And it really comes down to the question is, um, is it okay to hit children? Which you'd think is a crazy question because children are of course almost universally regarded as the most vulnerable members of society the most in need of protection, the most um, uh, in need of, 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 of protection by responsible adults. And, and yet the question of corporal punishment is literally a debate around uh, who can hit children, when and how are they allowed to hit them, and, 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 and under what conditions and in what forms is this hitting reasonable? Um, which, which, which seems an astonishing question when you reflect on it, and yet, and yet it's a, across the world, um, there's, there's extensive disagreement about this, but also really widespread tolerance 
of, of this form of violence against children. Um, and of course, um, once again, we look to the research and 50 years of research very clearly shows that, that hitting children in the name of discipline has an, a, a wide range of negative outcomes, um, not least of which is it doesn't, it doesn't actually work. It works perhaps in the moment, but, but the longer term effects are exactly the opposite of what they intended to be. But it also causes interpersonal um, mental health um, negative outcomes, and we explored all of those. Um, so the interesting thing is then why do people continue to believe that they should hit their children when everything that is known by people who have studied this um, indicates that they shouldn't? And there we went on to look at this particular example of school bullying um, and why people defended these school bullies and protected the school and attacked the whistleblowers. And we, we then got into this quite sort of psychoanalytic notion of identification with the, the aggressor. And that's when we started exploring a kind of psychological dimension and saying, well, why do people actually end up defending the forms of violence that they've been victims of? And why do they end up idealizing people who are abusive? Like, why do people support bullies? Um, and one of those forms that's really socially visible at the moment across the world is why do they support social and political leaders who are bullies, who are, who are tyrants, who, who, um, whose strategies to be aggressive and to humiliate vulnerable people. Um, and so we try to explore those, the, those dynamics through this notion of identification with the aggressor and, and other concepts like um, Stockholm Syndrome. Um, and we mapped all of that out before going on to a, a, a second um, focus on uh, the issue of children and violence, um, which really in a way was looking at the question of, of is there a, a link between being a victim of violence and becoming a perpetrator of violence? Um, how do cycles of violence get perpet perpetrated? And this is a really interesting question because we often have this theory, you know, we, we see a TV, series or program and this and this person who is the serial killer or abuser or something we see that they had a childhood of traumatic experience but but how does that work how does someone go from being victimized to being a victimizer um from fr from being brutalized to becoming a perpetrator um and there, there, there's many different ways of thinking about that but one of the ways we looked at which is one which is interesting because it doesn't assume that there has to be the kind of violence we normally associate with abuse. It doesn't have to be like sexual abuse. It doesn't have to be extremely violent physical abuse um, or even necessarily serious verbal abuse. There can simply be a kind of brutalization in the failure to meet basic emotional needs that, that children have very, very deep emotional needs and if and if those are not met that harms them um, and we talked about that and we talked about attachment theory and, and 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 you know what is necessary for positive attachment and and the harm that is done by where where the, where the, the, that, the, 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 that those kind of psychological supports are not provided and you and you have um um the 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 emerging emotional needs not being met and then we argued that, that this was important because there are two fundamental capacities in people that develop with good psychological care, that with good psychological attachment, and that these two capacities are directly related to um, the risk of people becoming violent. The first is the capacity for empathy, the ability to feel what other people are feeling, the ability to care about people. Um, the ability, to, the tendency to want to help them rather than harm them, okay? And we showed that the absence of empathy creates a risk that people will use instrumental violence. And if you remember the difference between instrumental and expressive violence, instrumental violence is that kind of calculating violence. It's like, oh, I'm going to do this in order to make that person do that. Uh, I'm going to hold a gun to their head so that they give me their money. But that's only one form of violence. But, but the absence of empathy means that people can be ruthless. They can exploit each other. They, can, they, 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 they don't care. 
what harm they're doing um, as long as it's getting them what they want. Um, so, so empathy is much more effective than, than what, how we normally think about preventing violence, which is deterrence, which is saying, well, you'll get punished if you don't do it. Uh, actually, empathy is the, is the more powerful way of regulating um, the violence that people exercise on each other. Okay. But the other big capacity, um, which is often less recognized, is the capacity for self-regulation, the ability to not be overwhelmed by your emotions, the ability to not go into, a, become kind of crazed with rage and, and, and despair, um, the ability to, to, to feel emotions in a manageable way and respond to them in a, in a kind of thoughtful way. Um, and the absence of that capacity for self-regulation, which is also um, a, an outcome of, of, of good care and, and positive attachment, is the risk of expressive violence. And, and, and we said um, later in the course that expressive violence is really underrated, that most, most violence between people isn't kind of criminals using instrumental violence, like using threats to get something. It's people being emotionally, explosively violent, people getting into an argument and stabbing someone, people, um, uh, people uh, in relationships um, losing their tempers and be be becoming abusive, um, parents looking after children, kind of um, going into rages and, and, and harming them. So those, those kind of emotional outbursts of violence are actually a much bigger social problem than these kind of calculated uh, acts of criminal violence where the goal is to you know, acquire property or something like that. And, and this is why looking at that aspect of children and violence became really important and understanding the, both the, the cycles of violence in terms of the, of the psychological development, but also the way in which that allowed us to think about prevention and say we can, we can prevent people, we, we can do a lot to, to make people less at risk of becoming violent by ensuring that there are appropriate forms of care very early on, not, not in later life at the, at the points where kind of destructive behavior has already come into play. Okay, so let's just give ourselves a second there. We've gone through a lot of different ideas now. But we then went on to do something very important, which is look at um, violence and gender. And we talked about, firstly, masculinities. And, and we said there's something really interesting about the gendered nature of violence. One thing that many people kind of already assume is that men are the primary perpetrators of physical violence. They're much more likely to be uh, perpetrators of actual acts of physical violence. But also, and this is the part that is often left out, they also much more likely to be the victims of violence. Men are men experience um, physical um, uh, abuse when they're children. The men experience bullying. Men experience um, assaults at a far higher rate and, and, and they are murdered at a far higher rate than women. Um, so there's an interesting gendering of violence going on there that we need to think about, that men are both perpetrators, but, but also very, very importantly, they're also more likely to be victims of almost all kinds of violence with the exception of intimate partner and sexual violence, which is exactly what we look at in the two weeks following this. And the first thing we said is that, that to understand this, we need to understand the social construction of masculinities. Uh, we don't need to resort to any kind of, you know, evolutionary, biological, deterministic theories of masculinity, which are, 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 don't explain a lot of the patterns we see. We need to look at the way in which, which, which men are forced to be uh, to adopt masculine roles, and usually violently forced through, through humiliation, through physical uh, brutalization, um, young boys are punished for, for, for not adopting masculine roles. They're punished for being, appearing to be feminine. Um, and so there's a, there's a violent policing of masculinities, which, which, which then produces these toxic masculinities that, that are so linked to um, violence. And in introducing the notion of toxic masculinity, we try to be clear that 
the, the issue is not that, 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 that men are inherently toxic. Um, it's exactly the opposite, is that there are, there are different kinds of masculinity that are socially constructed and that some of them are really harmful. But the point being that they're not simply harmful for other people, they're harmful for the, the, the people who, who, who exist in those roles. That toxic masculinities are harmful for men. They, they actually, they, they create massive problems. They, they, they directly link to the fact that men have shorter life expectancy. Men have much higher suicide rates. They're much more likely to die of stress-related disorders. Um, that, and so, so we need to think, see that toxic masculinity is not just about, um, you know, men being abusive to other people. It's about, it's about a, where a system of gender harms everyone. But, and some of the key elements of that toxic masculinity that we looked at is that the idea of dominance, that men are expected to be powerful, to be in control. Linked to dominance is the idea of aggression, that they're allowed to use violence to achieve those goals. They're allowed to exert their dominance through violence. They're allowed to solve social problems through violence. Um, but what they're not allowed to do is even more important than that, is that they're not allowed to um, express vulnerability. They're not allowed to to um, uh, show vulnerability, to show that they need support. They're not allowed to seek support. They've got to they've got to solve all problems by these acts of, of aggressive assertion, um, and not by pro-social, help-seeking, uh, emotionally communicative um, alternative means. Um, and the, what this does is, is it normalizes masculine aggression. And it also does, it doesn't just normalize masculine aggression, it erases the issue of masculine vi of victimization. It erases the way in which men are actually brutalized, that young boys are, are severely brutalized as we looked at in the section on bullying, that, that toxic masculinity has powerful negative effects on men right through their lives. Um, so the important thing there is that we 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 looked at um, these risks as being as as being related to gender, but as being socially constructed and often socially constructed through through violence. That 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 men are forced into toxic masculinity through an elaborate system of of humiliation and bullying that is extremely damaging, um, and that if we if we need to deal with one of the core issues in violence, which is its links to masculinity, we really need to think about how what it would mean to 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 totally change those, those systems of masculine socialization. Okay, from then we went on to to look at both sexual violence and intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence we identified as a really a massive problem, an extraordinarily widespread problem, to the extent that we said that, 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 that uh, uh, across the board, um, on average, about half of all police call-outs, like literally all police call-outs for any reason at all, half of them are actually re related to kind of domestic incidences. So it's, it's almost like all, all criminal problems uh, together only... Uh, only make up as much uh, of a problem as, as the problem of intimate partner violence. It's also very, very underreported that even within it being such a massive reason for call out, there's also the issue that most of it is not reported. Most, um, you know, often it's reported at the level where it's really serious, where obviously where there's a death or very, very serious um, injury re re requiring urgent medical intervention, but often sort of everyday forms of intimate partner violence are, are ignored um, and ignored by the perpetrators and victims uh, as well as by the bystanders. And we talked about the way in which it's a particularly complicated problem because it's one thing being brutalized by a stranger. You know, it's one thing being assaulted on the street. It's a very different thing where there are complex emotional and social bonds between the perpetrator and the victim. It's a very different thing where the, where the victim loves the perpetrator um, and, and in fact is trying to work towards having a positive relationship with them. Um, so, so this complexity, the fact that you, that you have these emotional ties and violence at the same time, 
in the same situation um, is a huge is a huge part of the problem. And so we need to look at it um, differently. Once again, to move away from the, the simply the idea of you know punishing offenders and trying to understand how does this problem come into being. And once again, the, the thing that jumps out at us is the question of gender roles um, and these patterns of, of masculine aggression and dominance, but the opposite pattern, right? The patterns of feminine acquiescence and submission, the fact that women are taught that they that they have to they have to um, submit to um, other people's expectations of them, that they have to try and please other people, that they have to try and change what they're doing um, in ways that are sort of convenient um, to other people and fit in with the desires of other people. And that, 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 that this potentially creates a very, very dangerous uh, imbalance um, where the masculine aggression and, and feminine submission actually set, set a scenario in which, which um, moves into various forms of violence. And, and, and we talked a lot about the fact that it doesn't have to be physical violence, that it can be um, that whole spectrum of coercive control that we discussed, that all of those, um, all of those controlling behaviors um, uh, can be very, very psych psychologically powerful and that they can also um, either be damaging in and of themselves, or they can escalate into ac actual acts of physical violence. Um, and so once again, they're at the core of the analysis, we have the question of um, social constructions of gender um, and risks of violence. But we also identified then the patterns that happen. And one of the interesting things um, with intimate partner violence is is, is this identification of a cycle. Um, and, and, and what's interesting is the third phase in the cycle. Um, so the first phase being where the, where, where, where the aggressive partner starts becoming um, stressed, starts becoming irritable, starts becoming uh, clearly um, um, tense and moving towards aggression. Um, and, and that the, um, that the, the, the vulnerable partner will often at this point be trying to do any, everything they can to kind of de-escalate it, to stop the tension, uh, to give the person what they want, to please them in whatever way. But the tension builds up until the second phase, which is the explosive phase, which is that's when the, the, the abuse happens, where, you know, whether it's verbal, whether it's physical. Um, and that's, what, that's where we generally identify the incident of violence. But interestingly, after that, there's often this third phase of reconciliation. And this is what's often not understood by people who, who don't have real insight into intimate partner violence. This is a phase where often the, the abuser uh, expresses remorse, uh, tries to do a lot of things to kind of make up, you know, buys gifts, apologizes, um, promises to change their behavior. And it's precisely that phase that is, that is the phase that, that, that actually creates the ongoing risk. If there was just the explosive violence and then nothing, it would be far easier for the vulnerable person to identify and escape from that situation. But because there's this kind of remorseful, apologetic phase afterwards where there's an attempt at rebuilding the intimacy of the relationship, um, um, th that that becomes very easy to be psychologically entrapped in that and to really and really hold to that reconciliation phase and say, well, yes, if we do this, then it won't happen again. We won't have the escalation of tension. We won't have the explosion again. But of course, it always does come again. And, the, and thus the cycle becomes repeated. The danger being the cycle gets worse every time and more dangerous every time. And, and, the, and the vulnerable person is actually in, increasingly in a worse and worse psychological and physical state. We also said that, that from the sort of aggressive side, that, um, that, that, they, they, that intimate partner violence can be linked to things that we talked about um, when we talked about um, attachment theory. And precisely um, one of the things we see in people who, who, who are 
um, aggressors in intimate partner violence is the idea that they are often experience very, very intense, unmanageable, overwhelming emotions. That they that that they the emotions are extremely um, overwhelming and they have great difficulty regulating them. And particularly insecure and jealous emotions or feelings of abandonment. And often the intimate partner kind of rage um, will be related to these feelings of jealousy, insecurity, or abandonment. Um, and of course, this is linked to, to two things. It's, it's, it's linked to, to the fact that people may find those emotions so intense and overwhelming because they have, they've never had those emotional needs properly met, that there's a deep um, kind of sense in which the, 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 those emotional needs are not safe for them. Those emotional needs are terrifying and overwhelming. But that then gets combined with something else, which is the whole structure of toxic masculinity. The fact that they can't express that vulnerability, they can't seek help for that vulnerability, they can't acknowledge or articulate that vulnerability. So, so, so it gets trapped inside them as this kind of ongoing threat. And so there we, we, we see this, the, this, this problem of um, kind of emotional um, instability linked to the, the dangerousness of, um, of, 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 the, of toxic masculinity or the acceptance of certain kinds of, of violence um, and, and a complex pattern there. That said, of course, we should not conclude that um, intimate partner violence is reducible to violence by men against women. It certainly isn't. And we, we certainly see that, um, that, that this happens across all um, kinds of relationship. Uh, it happens uh, in same-sex relationships. It happens um, with male victims and female perpetrators. It matters. Uh, it, it happens in, across relationships in, uh, across non-binary gender minorities, um, all of these things. So, so these patterns are, are pervasive. They can't be, they're not reducible simply to kind of patriarchy and toxic masculinity. Um, but there are certain very serious aggravating factors which we can identify. Similarly, we looked at um, sexual violence and we said same patterns as intimate partner violence in that it's very widespread, far more than is commonly acknowledged and, and above all is underreported, is the most underreported of all crimes. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. But once again, like intimate partner violence, like the stuff we looked at in masculinities, it's deeply related to gender roles and deeply related to masculine dominance and entitlement and uh, the idea of feminine uh, submissiveness. Um, and the useful concept that we introduced here was the notion of rape culture. Um, and the idea that rape culture describes a system that normalizes the conditions that 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 make rape possible. Um, it doesn't necessarily overtly, in fact, it almost never does overtly allow rape, but always still criminalizes and officially um, you know, claims that rape is is a highly undesirable um, social practice. But it but at the same time as it can be officially um, outlawed, it, it creates the conditions, in fact, which it's actually tolerated um, and, and made a high risk. Um, and, and, and so we identify these, these underlying patterns, um, the sense of male entitlement, the sense of woman being made vulnerable, the sense of the, of the, of the social system protecting men, um, uh, making it difficult to, to, um, for women to protect themselves against male sexual aggression, uh, but also ma making this very difficult to hold men responsible for their acts of, of um, sexual aggression. Um, and we look then at the importance of things like the Me Too movement um, in bringing about those changes, breaking the silence around the reporting um, of um, uh, sexual aggression and exploitation um, and, and producing a kind of a, a, a better, more widespread social understanding of these forms of violence, but also providing kind of solidarity amongst uh, 
victims that empowers them to take action, even when sometimes taking that action is very difficult. Um, and one of the key things that we talked about there is, is moving away from, from um, tertiary interventions, like you know, just the, the, the criminal justice prosecution interventions, the punitive interventions, um, and instead focusing on primary interventions, the, the interventions that, that actually change the system, that, that makes these things less likely to happen. We don't want to just wait until people have already been hurt before the so social system kicks in and, and punishes perpetrators. We actually want to, we, we, we want to transform the entire social system so that these things are much less likely to happen. And that primary intervention we discussed at length about the way that would have to be an intervention that into the construction of these toxic gender roles um, that really define the, the system of rape culture. Okay, then finally, we covered what I at the time said I thought was the most important single concept in the course, which was the notion of structural violence. And here we said that we need to look at the social systems that harm people. Uh, we're not now looking at, in the, at aggressors. We're not looking at individuals who attack and harm, individuals who have a kind of malicious intent towards other people. And we're certainly not requiring that this involves acts of physical violence. It can entail acts of physical violence, but it, but it certainly doesn't need them. What we're really looking at is the way in which social systems harm some people and not others. The way some people, um, uh, life expectancy is less, the way some people will, 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 will suffer in ways that are not necessary. And one of the ways we, we looked at is in terms of, you know, disease, like some, you know, some, um, but, but it's not just disease, it's all forms of social suffering. Some people live in they, they live in fear, they live in, um, in, 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 in suffering, they don't have the shelter, they don't have the food, they don't have the medical protection, they don't have the social support, they don't have the cultural freedoms that other people have. And all of those things, the, 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 the loss of all of those things, the lack of all of those things is, is a form of violence. Um, and so what we're identifying is that, that the, the social system which, which harms uh, entire groups of people in, in those kinds of ways needs to be identified as a violent social system. And in talking about that, um, we, we, we said we need to describe this as structural violence, the, 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 the removal of, of well-being, the, the removal of safety, and instead placing people at risk and hardship and suffering needs to be talked about as a form of as, um, structural violence. And we immediately saw that structural violence is linked to social inequality um, and that structural violence is actually an expression of other, of, of the existing forms of inequality, inequality in resources, inequality in rights, uh, in, inequality in autonomy, all of those kinds of things. Um, but the big problem that we can easily identify structural violence, and we, we gave so many different examples, we talked about global warming even as a form of structural violence, um, is that it's mostly not recognized. It's certainly not recognized under the everyday common sense notion of violence. And not only that, but it's not recognized under the kind of criminal codes of violence. And so it's really very hard to prosecute or take action against these forms of violence, even if we can show who's being harmed, who's dying, becomes very, very hard to hold anyone responsibility responsible. And one of the reasons for this is that precisely the people who benefit from systems of social, uh, of structural violence, precisely the people who are in the positions of privilege are also the people who get to define uh, the discourses of violence, they get to def define what is called violence or not, and they get to, to define what is classified as criminal and what is not. So the, so the, the hiddenness of structural violence is, is not an accident. It's, it's, it's deeply linked to, to, who, to, to the fact that violence is contested and the idea of violence is contested and some, some people have more power to define it than others. Um, and that there's a real need to push back against the, 
the dominant definitions of violence and 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 the ways in which certain forms of violence are not um, recognized within those de um, definitions and also that's not criminalized within those definitions. Um, so the idea of structural violence really opened up a lot of different things, but above all, it opened up this difficult, difficult question of the fact that when we talk about structural violence, we're primarily not talking about perpetrators. We're not talking about sort of bad people who should be in jail. We're talking about systems. And when we start identifying those systems, we start seeing ourselves in those systems. And we start seeing ourselves as implicated in systems of structural violence um, and, and, and ourselves having responsibility for those systems of structural violence. Um, that, that the way in which simply by living our lives, people are being put at risk. Uh, people are being exploited in sweatshops for the commodities we're buying in the supermarkets. Um, animals are being killed because of um, uh, the uh, particular forms of agribusiness and the idea of, of, of the um, use of animals as food. Um, that our, our everyday practices of transport and heating and all of those things are contributing to global warming in a way that we know will cause devastating harm to future generations. So the way in which we ourselves are suddenly um, bound up in responsibility for forms of harm in a way that we might not be if we were just um, thinking of ourselves in terms of criminal harm. We, we certainly you know, might not think of ourselves as someone who would mug someone or, or um, assault someone. Nevertheless, just by, just by living in the society we live in with the lifestyles we have, we are implicated in structural violence. And this becomes a really, a really deep and complex problem for, that we need to give a lot more thought to. Okay, so that was pretty much what we covered. Um, and in conclusion, then, just to say um, a number of key points. Um, what we've what we've really looked at in the course is 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 is, is violence as a concept. What is, what does it mean to call something violent, um, and how that is changing, and how it's contested, um, and also the impact that has. Like, if we think of certain things as violence, it changes the way we think about each other and the way we think about society. And that we need to move away from this idea of interpersonal violence, especially interpersonal violence uh, involving strangers, like criminal strangers, like muggers and uh, people like that. We need certainly those are very serious problems and risks. But we need also need to go beyond the idea of this of of, of the outsider criminal to look at the ways in which people are violent towards each other in everyday life, in families, in caregiving relationships, in intimate partnerships, um, in social networks. Um, and here we need to look very carefully at how some kinds of violence on, are, are actually accepted, um, not seen as violence, normalized, justified. Um, you know, the, and the classic example, there was the example of corporal punishment, which is seen as justifiable and normal um, across a range of, of, of cultural contexts. Um, and also the way in which a wide range of kinds of violence are not criminalized. Um, and, and, and that they, they forms of violence that are both kind of below the level of, of criminality, like the everyday bullying and, and, and emotional abuse and things like that. And then they're the kind of the big forms of violence that are almost above the criminal system, the global systems of exploitation and inequality that are not criminalized. Um, and here it becomes so clear that violence is linked to, to two things, firstly to social norms, and secondly to social inequalities. And we can't think very deeply about violence without thinking about social inequality. And this really highlights the fact that the that the traditional way in which we've thought about violence, which has tended to be a criminal justice punitive kind of way, is just not going to solve the problem. That we need to, certainly we need to have that system and that system needs to be effective, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it's really not on the way to being a complete solution. And um, what we need instead is to think much more deeply about primary preve prevention, what it means to identify the underlying causes, 
the social constructions of gender, the uh, emotional needs of, of children being met in ways that allow them to develop self-regulation and empathy, um, the, the forms, the way in which the, inis, the, the inequalities and in the distribution of, of resources, um, basic necessities of life, but also freedoms and, and the, the everyday means of people sort of le leading happy and fulfilled lives, um, how those need to be looked at, um, both as those inequalities as being harmful in themselves, but also as, um, as, as creating the conditions that increase the risks of other forms of violence, uh, other forms in which those frustrations and desperations and, and um, explode into acts of interpersonal violence. And so we see overall that, that in, in thinking through this link between um, violence, norms and inequalities, we really need to, to have a very, very clear and effective notion of structural violence and to understand that the, the kinds of harm that are caused by, by structural violence are actually much greater than those that are normally documented as criminal acts of violence, that, that, that these, these, these impact massively um, and globally um, and we need to think about them more deeply. And so, as you see, we've, we've really shifted, you know, from this idea of, well, what are we going to do about violent criminals to really a different question almost, which is, which is how are we going to make sure that people are okay? How are we going to make sure that people aren't harmed? How are we going to, 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 to sort of get rid of the problem of violence in all its forms and not simply, you know, after the event in, by trying to punish perpetrators, but in, a, but in, a, in a, a preventative way that actually stops people being harmed and brutalized in the first place by fundamentally changing the conditions which allow that to happen. And that's really the challenge at the end of this course.